Our ability to worship as we please, to speak freely, to have an independent news media, to peacefully gather in groups, and the right to complain about or ask for assistance from our government without the fear of punishment. These are all made possible by the First Amendment of our United States Constitution. During our highly partisan political times, the Pennsylvania Bar Association and its Bar Press Committee wanted to know if our next generation of voters understands its rights. How do young people view the freedoms guaranteed by the Constitution? To find out, the Pennsylvania Bar Association and its Bar Press Committee enlisted a number of partners. Muhlenberg College's Institute of Public Opinion created a survey for local high school students based upon a national survey by the Freedom Forum Institute in Washington, D.C. PBS 39 recorded the unveiling of the sometimes surprising survey results to high school students and others at Parkland High School in Allentown, Pennsylvania, along with questions by students and answers and other information provided by those who follow the issues. The result is the program that you are about to see, the State of the First Amendment. Good morning. My name is Rich Snizak, Superintendent of Schools for the Parkland School District. On behalf of the Parkland Board of School Directors, the administration, faculty, and staff, I wish to welcome all the invited guests and the PBS 39 viewing audience to Parkland High School for this educational program designed to raise awareness of First Amendment rights, a cornerstone of our democracy. I wish to extend a special welcome and thanks to the Parkland High School 12th grade student class and staff for their contributions and participation in this first of its kind forum. An important role of public education is to educate our youngsters about their role in our democracy, not only in the classroom, but also by being role models and supporting our freedoms as provided by the Constitution. The First Amendment to the United States Constitution states, and I quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances, end quote. Educating our students regarding their First Amendment rights is a common curricular standard in public schools and supports preparation of an informed and engaged electorate. Due to continuous advancements in technology and access to the internet, today our students are more engaged, doing more listening, and are more frequently sharing their opinions. Therefore, teaching students about their right to protest and political and religious expression is essential. As technology has placed the world of knowledge in their hands via the utilization of a smartphone. Today's program promises to be a unique learning experience for our Parkland senior class as we compare their knowledge of the state of the First Amendment in comparison to the published results gathered from a national audience surveyed by the Freedom Forum Institute of the First Amendment Center. I wish to thank all our sponsors for their contributions and support of this program. <clears throat> I personally wish to thank David Erdman, adjunct instructor in media and communications at Muhlenberg College, working in conjunction with Pennsylvania Bar Association's Bar Press Committee and attorney Craig Stoudenmire for developing and coordinating this unique event. On behalf of the students and staff of Parkland High School, I thank you for bringing us this tremendous learning experience. We hope you enjoy the program. Thank you. Hello, Trojans. Hi there, everyone. I'm Monica Evans. I'm a host and executive producer at PBS. We're broadcasting from Parkland High School in Allentown, Pennsylvania, to bring you this special presentation about the First Amendment. There are a lot of people who are un unaware of the freedoms of the First Amendment, but we hope by the end of this broadcast, many more will understand those provisions. The goal is to gauge what people think nationally about the First Amendment and to hear what you, students here at Parkland, think and know about the First Amendment. 
I want to take you now to our nation's capital so that you can have a good understanding of what the First Amendment is. You know, it's critical that we understand this, this protective factor for all of us within the First Amendment. If people uh, in our society, in a particular group, feel that they're not being heard, traditionally Americans have taken to the street. Young people have to understand that they have a voice. I'm Gene Polosinski. I'm President and Chief Operating Officer of the Freedom Forum Institute, which is the Programs and Initiatives Partner of the Museum. So we're sort of the think tank behind the building that is here in Washington. We're out there, we hope, the, helping the public make their own decisions about their freedoms. Very few of us know much about the First Amendment at all. Uh, this year, uh, under 6% could identify all five freedoms. Frankly, as Americans, we sort of treat the First Amendment like air. We assume it will always be there. We assume it will always work for us. We worry that the public, by not knowing much about it, and frankly not seeing much of a change over the last 20 years, uh, is vulnerable to um, a person who has a very seductive argument to maybe limit our freedom. Religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. Those are the five freedoms, and those go to work with us every single day of our lives as citizens. Well, we have freedom of religion, which is an interesting um, and unique aspect in the history of humanity. There's never been a nation before where you really had true freedom of religion as we do here. Government doesn't get to set a faith that everybody has to follow. You get to make the decision about which of a whole range of faiths you want to follow. And then comes freedom of speech. And that covers all kinds of speech. It's not just spoken word, but it might be an armband that you would wear, or expressive speech. Press is more narrowly defined. It's not just, though, journalism. It's anybody's right to write and, and use their written word, or today online communication, to convey an idea or an object, and we protect that very vigorously. Uh, then you have the rights of petition and assembly. But petition is really the right to say to government, I want you to change. I want you to do this for me or for my group. And then there's the right of assembly, which means you have the right to get together with people of like minds. Petition and assembly, right of an individual to seek change. Assembly, the right of a group of people to seek change. So those are our core freedoms. And I think if you look through those, you see it's the mechanism by which each of us as a citizen is able to influence policy decisions. We're able to self-govern. That's why it's so core to what it means to be an American. First Amendment freedoms are never safe and secure. They're always in the process of being made safe and secure. And I think it's really important to say, you know, these really define our society today. The test will be this generation and the one at Parkland, the next generation, will they step up to that challenge of defending the First Amendment? Joining us in the flesh to present the national results of the current state of the First Amendment is Jean Polisinski. Polisinski is president and chief operating officer of the Freedom Forum Institute, part of the museum in Washington, D.C. He is also one of the founding editors of USA Today and a longtime proponent of diversity in journalism as an essential element of the free press. Joining Jean to discuss the local survey results of the First Amendment from you students here at Parkland High School is Christopher Boric. Boric is a political science professor at Muhlenberg College, and he's also the director of the Muhlenberg College Institute of Public Opinion. Gentlemen, take the podiums, please. Well, good morning. This is a conversation and a chance to really look at uh, the core values of our society that uh, will be in your hands soon to define what it means to be a citizen of the United States. It's a pretty daunting responsibility. Uh, and unfortunately, people in my generation and uh, younger, uh, I think, have lost sight of that task sometimes. So we're going to run through some numbers, and Dr. Bork and I will um, uh, talk about the results, and we'll, we'll sort of make our way through, and then uh, we'll hopefully have a conversation with you as the, as the morning progresses. So uh, we can open up, really, with... Um, a slide that uh, says, by the way, most of America, in, uh, when we ask, uh, what, do you know your freedoms? Uh, can you name any specific ones? Most of America flunks. I'm proud to say that you didn't, so congratulate yourselves on that. Uh, you did a much better job. <laughs> you know, I, I mentioned that uh, typically under 6% can name all five freedoms. This year it was only 2%, 2 out of 100, uh, 
and the reason for that is, as you can see, uh, we get some other creative answers as well. Uh, petition is the one that typically uh, most Americans can't name. And interestingly, uh, Chris, the founders uh, of this uh, nation um, thought that petition was uh, the most important of the freedoms because it gave an opportunity uh, for you to speak truth to power. And that goes all the way back to the Magna Carta when a bunch of admittedly, like, I think 35 barons, if I remember right, got the right to tell the king a few things without getting their head chopped off. Yeah. Not exactly what we would call freedom of speech today, but it was good enough for that time. But it was that right to go to the powerful, the people who uh, either by force or by rule of a tradition or, in our case, by election, run the government temporarily on our behalf. We have the right to tell them, even after we elect them, uh, what we want them to do. So petition comes along. The next uh, most prominent, I think, in, in uh, both surveys was the right of assembly, so that you know you have the right to assemble. Um, but the one that everybody gets, I think, uh, most often, and, and the 93%, I think it shows, uh, on freedom of speech is remarkable. We've never gotten really over the 60% rate in America to name that freedom. Uh, so overall, you're just amazingly impressive on, on your knowledge about First Amendment freedoms, much more so than the rest of the country. But speech, and then the next most commonly mentioned is uh, freedom of, of uh, often freedom of religion. Uh, this year, um, you know, just barely the second selection. Again, two-thirds of you know that you have freedom of religion. Uh, and then we march through freedom of press and the right of uh, assembly and petition. So, you know, Chris, on this survey, what, what do you attribute other than being really smart people, uh, this knowledge about the First Amendment. Uh... Yeah, Gene, that's one of the first things I noticed is the difference between the Parkland population and the national population. And I, I think that's a, a product, as Gene just alluded to. Um, your bright young students, your programs here at Parkland have probably educated you very nicely about those rights, making you aware of those, understanding those, discussing those. It's absolutely wonderful that that's where you are right now. What's the big question for us is do you retain that and do you hold that moving forward? In other words, we can see the general population in the United States doesn't have that deep knowledge and understanding of the fundamental Bill of Rights uh, and, and First Amendment uh, protections that you have. Most of you know those, uh, at least a number of those at this moment. If you have those understandings and you're able to take those out with you, as you if you will, like a toolbox into life over time, it makes a difference. So right now, 93% of you, I'd, I'd hate to see if we went back in 10 years or 15 years and talked to you again, and you were near that 56% mark, or dropping down in freedom of religion to, to near the 15% mark. Our big worry in life is that these things drift over time. So right now, stay where you are. Let me give you a little history about the State of the First Amendment survey. I wanted you to have that initial result and see how well you did, uh, frankly. We didn't want to hide that news. But um, we started doing that survey in 1997. Uh, typically, it's 1,000 uh, adults, those over 18, uh, who we asked that question. We participated in other surveys with the Knight Foundation, for example, that surveyed 100,000 high school students as well as their teachers. But uh, the State of the First Amendment survey does those over 18. Typically, again, it's about 1,000. I think this year was 1,006. And, and something for you to remember, and, and I'm going to turn to my polling expert for more advice on this, but it has what we call, well, I don't know if pollsters like it. I call it the error factor. I think it's the margin of it's error. something, but a margin of error. But uh, what it means is in this survey, uh, we had a, a margin of 3.6%, which in my simple terms means if you went out and asked 1,000 people these questions, you got these answers. If you were to pick another 1,000 randomly, and ask them the questions. It might go up 3.6% and it might go down 3.6% with something called 90% confidence. It means you're pretty likely to get the answers. So when you see survey results that are less than that margin, uh, or you look at it going either way, essentially it's a tie. So when somebody in an electoral result, we were talking about the polling being done around the midterm elections, if they're a 2% lead, no, uh, not if the margin uh, is, is greater than that. Is that fair explanation? Very, very good yeah. description. And one of the impressive things about this group uh, is that we talked to about 600 
of you. Most of you in this room probably uh, completed the survey at, at some time. So of the student population, roughly 800 or so uh, in your class, that's a, a, a large portion. It gives us great confidence that the numbers that we uh, collected for you are very representative of Parkland students as a whole. So uh, if I, in my regular polls, if I was able to get a completion rate like I did yeah. with, with this group, it would be exceptional. So great work. Yeah, so and you should always, you know, read polls with some skepticism, including ours. You need to say, well, how were the questions asked? You know, what was the tone? Did somebody tilt the question? I'm always worried about questions that start out, don't you think that? Because that sort of leans you and pushes you in one direction or not. So uh, when you move forward in your lives and you see a lot of these polling results, uh, apply those kind of standards to the questions that you see. We didn't chart you because the result was, I thought, just extraordinary. But you can see how the number bounced around among adults uh, asked this question. You know, once we determined that the adults answering our survey didn't know what the First Amendment freedoms, we went ahead and told them. And then we said, take a moment and consider, what do you think if, do, do, do we go too far with those freedoms? You know, we know there's a great diversity of opinion. And, and frankly, I'll tell you, in every, any given year, there's a thought that when the movements of, you know, taking over public squares and then the Tea Party movements were going, people were, oh, there's too much right to assemble and petition. Or when there was a significant uh, uh, mistake by the press in the 2000 election, declaring Florida and then having to pull it back and the whole Bush Gore thing. Um, there was a, a great dislike of the press at that point. And so in any given year, people might think one of the freedoms maybe goes too far. But you can see it varies. Well, look at 2002. 49% of us said that the freedoms that we've had for, at that point, about 220 years were, were too great, that we had too much freedom. Well, that survey was taken about eight months after the 9-11 attack. The years go on. You can see it bounces around. It gets down to 13%. And then in 2013, 2012, um, you see it bounced back up to 38%. That was about eight weeks after the Boston Marathon bombing. So right away, we had more than a third of us say, approaching four out of ten, say that we were too free. So when I'm asked about First Amendment freedoms, and the reason I wanted to come back right after the slide about your great knowledge about the First Amendment, is to say, if you take the adult sampling, who, who really don't even know the names of those freedoms very well, and you get a factor like fear, look at what happens. We are all of a sudden much more, I think, seducible to somebody who comes along with an argument that says, you know, if we just didn't have this, or that person couldn't speak, or that group couldn't be allowed to organize or have a voice in the public square, we'd be better off, don't you think? In the backdrop of fear of violence and attack, we might just as a society accept that. You know, 50, you only need 2% more than 49% to have a majority in an election. The more you understand your freedoms, the more you're going to guard them, you're going to protect them. I don't often fear the great dictator coming down the middle of Pennsylvania Avenue, which is where the museum is located, uh, to take away our freedoms. I actually fear more well-meaning people who will say, you know, we could get along except for that one freedom we should, we should do without. I know you do work around elections and, and freedom. Uh, the fear being your greatest it, it, threat, it's maybe? A great, it's a great point, Gene. And uh, I'll, I'll step back for one second and, and look at that 10% mark, right? You are lower at, at this population of Parkland students than any time in the polls that Gene has done over time with the national numbers. Only 10% of you said that, probably because you tend to know more about the First Amendment uh, and the rights that are there than the general public as a whole. In other words, you know what they are, and therefore they're more important, and you might not be as willing to sacrifice them. And during those periods where fear is elevated, after 9-11, after Boston, we tend to see individuals willing to give up some of those rights. And that's, to me, one of the most complex and interesting parts of governing and thinking about this. I always say the most interesting, important topics are when two goods hit together. We love security. We love safety. We want to make sure our lives are preserved and, and, and comfortable in many ways. Uh, but what happens when they conflict with rights, uh, freedoms, things that we cherish and value? In 2002 or, or 2013, after major events, uh, we tend to want to sacrifice those. And I think so much of that might be related to what we know and what we think about them. So I think it's great that you, you bring us some perspective on that, Gene, over time. The battle to gain a freedom is difficult. We see that in 
the civil rights movement, we see in the suffragette movement that gave women the right to vote. But even harder is to bring back a right or a freedom that you've given away. Because there's just a strong inertia from people to say, we did away with that. We don't need that. We can get along without it, uh, rather than the arguments in favor of it. So uh, one of the things, again, that worries me is when we get to that 49%, uh, that somebody can just come along with a very appealing argument that, as you said, let's balance safety. And I, I'm trying to remember, was it Ben Franklin who said those who would uh, value safety uh, and security over freedom uh, won't get the first and don't deserve the latter? Sorry. Uh, because it never quite works when you give up that right to speak. Uh, you give up much more than just uh, maybe the ability to voice your opinion. You cede control to government. And uh, the American experiment is all about taking back from uh, what was the colonial era, but then preserving our abilities to, uh, to have those core freedoms and to really, again, self-define ourselves as an American. So we'll go to some specific results uh, now. So we're... we're uh, we're looking here uh, with a lot of um, controversy now uh, as you move toward your college years, uh, but it may be true in your community as well. It might be true in some high schools where students have the ability to choose speakers to come in. We've seen very provocative speakers. Some would say speakers who deliberately provoke to get attention rather than to make a point be invited to campuses and then there's a reaction on the campus and sometimes those invitations are withdrawn and sometimes there's a, a speaker who is interrupted or prevented from speaking, some called heckler's veto. Um, and um, we thought we would ask the public some circumstances under which they thought it would be appropriate. So we asked adults, uh, when should colleges be able to retract an invitation to a speaker? And um, I, I was somewhat gratified to find that we're at least evenly divided on most of the cases because I will tell you on my personal preference is if you've invited a speaker, you're obligated to host them. And if it costs money for security or whatever it is, um, you pay that. And if you're in the audience, you listen to them and then maybe you make your point after. So we looked at this and we saw about half of adults say that cancel it if it's likely to provoke a large scale protest by students. Uh, less than half if it's just offensive to some people. And actually, I, wasn't, I was a little surprised to see that because very often when we personalize the First Amendment, we tend to be anti-First Amendment, to be honest. You know, I, I have a lot of free speech, but I'm not sure what you're going to say, so you have to I have to limit yours. This idea of uh, being considerate of others that might be offensive. Incite violence. Um, actually, I thought this was pretty low. That means one out of three of us is willing to accept the fact that a speaker might provoke violence. So that's a pretty strong commitment to free speech. And then again, about half say, you know, look, if it's public money, we have a right to decide. And you can see, uh, if, if you have the mental image of the, the slide before, that the Parkland students largely follow the patterns of the national polls and the national results, but a little bit elevated on almost each of these measures in terms of the ability to retract invitations. So, so individuals uh, in Parkland were slightly more, you were slightly more likely to say, for example, uh, that you could retract those invitations if you provoke large-scale protest or be likely to offend groups. Uh, a little bit higher on inciting violence or otherwise threaten public safety and, and about the same on supporting by public funds. It's interesting. You, on a lot of issues, we said you know more about uh, the First Amendment than lots of Americans. But in these particular examples, you were more likely to be able to say that the school should retract those invitations, which I always thought was pretty fascinating, that you're, you might know things about the rights, but you're willing in some ways to, to give them up in these cases. Now, these might be compelling arguments, right? They can be compelling arguments, and you don't necessarily want to see individuals um, lead to situations that are harmful or violent or cause any of those, those troubles. It was interesting to see how you largely follow the, the national patterns, but do differ a little bit in terms of being higher on this measure. Moving to an area that maybe is more familiar than just the, the open zone of the college campus, uh, we were talking about social media, which I know seems as if it's been around forever, but actually it's uh, only about as old as you are. So we were curious because there's a great debate over what should be said and what should be, quote, permitted on social media. Um, and so we thought we'd ask about some categories that most people identified as points of contention. Uh, and I will tell you, by the way, that, that the First Amendment does apply basically the social media way it applies to a newspaper or a book. Uh, we're seeing court decisions move 
those decisions long, up until 1953, I believe, the First Amendment actually didn't even protect movies. Um, it, movies were not under free speech protection. So uh, the law is moving much quicker on social media, so is society. So when we asked um, the National Survey, um, should social media's companies, you know, the, the Twitters, Facebooks for people my age to track your grandchildren's pictures, right? Uh, what about uh, removal of these kinds of things? So we had 72% of adults saying that social media companies should be alert and, and take action to remove hate speech. Um, 83% um, saying let's get rid of false information, fake news, uh, and then personal attacks. I was surprised that it wasn't hate speech number one. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I think the issue of false and misleading information is, is an intellectual exercise. Hate speech, uh, to me, is sort of an emotional response, and I really expected that we would see that higher number. So how did Parkland do? Yeah, let's see what Parkland says. Yeah. You can see, once again, not that different than the general public, that your opinions, even though you know more, uh, largely uh, roll with what Gene just showed for national audience of, of individuals. That seventy percent of you said social media companies should take off hate speech, eighty-one percent false information, and seventy-six personal attacks. Again, the, as you expected, Gene, the hate speech one uh, didn't measure, but large majorities uh, of you in this room were willing to do that. And, and once again, it's offensive. The things we're talking about, right? Obviously, hate speech, personal attacks, false information, all. Uh, are damaging in their own way. The idea of who gets to control, who gets to decide that, is ultimately uh, crucial in this. And, and what the question said were social media companies, so Facebook or Twitter or, or Snapchat, a lot of them are, are, are merged, as, as you know. Um, but ultimately, that power rests with them rather than maybe the individual. And this is an ongoing tension with freedom of, of expression, freedom of speech, uh, that at least in your minds, you're willing to, to hand that over. Well, if we can move to the next national result. Um, we, the First Amendment applies to government. It doesn't apply to parents. It does apply to teachers, administrators, superintendents, uh, because they're government officials. But um, what we have in the First Amendment is a protection against government telling us what to say or limiting our right to speak. Now, there are some different rules that apply to, uh, through the courts to um, high schools and middle schools and below. But uh, generally, we all have a right to say what we want, when we want, on any subject that we have. Uh, we, we see, a, again, in the previous question, what about you know, social media companies stepping in? But you know, Facebook and Twitter, and they're private companies. And they get to make their own rules. So maybe we thought, what if government were given the power to require these companies to monitor and remove content. Well, on the national level, if you add the strongly and somewhat agree, at least I hope I'm doing math fast, uh, is 48%. So about half of adults maybe see a role for government. It scares the heck out of me. 50% of us, or half of us almost, would say to government, you can have some role in telling me what I ought to be able to say in now one of the major ways I communicate with the planet and that's social media. I would like to explore this more. We hope to do some more surveys, but what would make people think it's okay to have the government step in and have a voice in what we're saying? And, and here I think we saw some significant differences. Yeah, let's move to the Parkland yeah. slide. And you can see in, in our results or your results, uh, on the whole, if you just take the agree and somewhat disagree, it's probably not that different. But you're far less likely to strongly agree with this. So again, your knowledge perhaps making you uh, less likely to really jump in and say, yeah, I, I could see that. I could strongly agree with that. As Gene was pointing out, and I'll do my math on the fly too, 54%, <laughs> most of you do agree. Most of you do agree. Maybe not as strongly. Uh, as the national numbers uh, and on that one measure, but still a majority of you do, while about 46%. So you're pretty divided as a, as a class at Parkland on this matter. This is one of those issues that, that has enormous ramifications because what you're asking, or we're asking, is would you turn it over to government to have some ability to say what can and cannot be put on social media uh, platforms? That's an enormous move. And again, the material might be objectionable, it might be painful, it might be harmful, it might be hateful, 
Uh, but are you willing to make that sacrifice? And at least in this question, in the way we asked it, a majority of you said you agree with that. I will tell you that James Madison, who is credited with writing the majority of, of the First Amendment law uh, and the First Amendment um, draft, uh, would probably just be the proverbial spinning in his tomb right now to say any uh, citizen say government should have a role in telling you what to say. But we have to get along. That's right. So, well, now let's turn to the media. <laughs> Perhaps one of the most contentious areas today in our society. How is the news media perceived? Media or news media is so varied in this country. Are you talking about the one tiny little part of 1% that is the National White House Press Corps and news media at that level? Are you talking about television versus print versus online? You know, it's almost impossible to define what the media is. But, you know, for aggregation purposes, and, and we can, you can define what media is to you. That's what we let our respondents do. We ask these questions. And um, these were three things that came up last spring uh, that journalism was deeply involved in, and that was the potential to have conflicts of interest. Do you have a spouse, for example, that maybe was a campaign uh, coordinator for uh, the opponent of the office holder, um, that even though they won, you're the reporter now and you're covering that, that person. Um, the traditional role for the media is to be what's called a watchdog on government. I don't know if you've heard that term in any of your classes, but this was one of the most important things, perhaps the most important thing, that the founders saw in giving such incredibly strong protection to freedom of the press. Uh, it's the only profession protected, by the way, in the Constitution. President Trump, not the first president, by the way, to threaten to remove credentials from people. Uh, uh, Barack Obama and George Bush, both Bushes, all had reporters who they found particularly irritating, and in one way or another, would, uh, would like to remove them from the ability to be at a briefing or, or cover their travels. I will say President Trump has raised that to a new art form, but again, not the first one to do it. So we asked these questions about, um, first, should they publicly disclose conflicts of interest? And the idea that a third of Americans would say, oh, we don't care if there's a conflict of interest. You know, I think ethically, journalists should always disclose a conflict of interest. So I was disappointed in, in the adults in this survey. Likewise, the watchdog on government, that number is actually back up a little bit. But there's a confidence level there that I worry about. What would make a quarter of our citizens say the watchdog role really is, is not significant to them? Yeah. And then the authority to deny press credentials, thank you, America. Uh, I think it's up to uh, the, the public and the public's representative in those briefing rooms to decide who can be there. And that's the system we've had imperfect as it is, and we're wrestling now with the definition of who is a journalist. It used to be you went to work in a great big building, television station or a newspaper uh, and, or radio station, and of course you were the press. Well, what do you do today with bloggers who may have a million uh, followers when you're, you have credentials given to newspapers that might have a 70,000 circulation? Who deserves that seat? Well, that's a, that's a tough question, but... Um, I, I think, again, it rests within the profession to settle that debate. Let's, let's see what Parklet says. Very similar. Your results are very, very uh, close to the national averages. Um, and the way I read this, uh, the results when I looked at them is, hey, you have, in terms of disclosing conflicts of interest, uh, most of you believe that's the media's job. Uh, three out of four of you do. Uh, Two-thirds of you think media is a watchdog. I was also a little bit surprised, even though that's a fairly high number, uh, that that wasn't even higher. It's an essential role, right, within American public. We can't always be the watchdog. You can't look at everything that's going on in government. Somebody has to have a role in that on a professional level, and that's always been the role of the media. Uh, and 32%, about a third of you, uh, said the president can deny. That was a little higher than national averages, uh, but largely in, in line. So you see a role for the media, you want them to disclose, and most of you don't want the president to have the ability to say who and who cannot be, uh, have press credentials at the White House. We're going to do one more national slide, and I think we're going to turn quickly to the rest of the Parkland results. Um, and this one is the so-called, I think it's a fever chart, sort of flattened out. Um, and it just gives you an idea of how the public has been on this watchdog idea. So 
Uh, you can take heart from the fact that it's been fairly consistent within the high 60s to to 80 percent that say you know that the press should have that function that agrees with the founders. So Chris, I'm going to turn to you now from a lot of the Parkland results. Great, we have a couple more slides to look at. Um, so we asked not only questions that were asked in the national survey uh, that Gene and his group have done for years. Uh, we did a, a number of homegrown questions that were developed by Parkland faculty uh, over the summer and in thinking about issues that are pertinent to you or important in your lives. Um, and we asked a couple. For example, what's the biggest problem facing the United States today? And we, were, we limited it to questions dealing with speech uh, and press and issues uh, like that. So we forced your hand a little bit in this question, and we gave you three choices, hate speech, fake news, and limits on free speech. About half of you said fake news. Uh, fake news is certainly something that's discussed a lot. Our leaders use that term. Uh, it's part of the public discourse. So maybe that's prompting you a little bit for it. Uh, but especially when I saw some of your earlier results, uh, the idea that hate speech perhaps wasn't as, as high uh, struck me as, as, as quite interesting um, or limits on free speech. So we're, we're kind of looking at, at fake news. The, the last two, you know, limiting free speech versus fake news, there's trade-offs, of course. Um, in how we, we think about those, but I think it was a little bit of a surprising finding. We'll go on to the next slide. So we asked, which of the following do you think is most responsible for determining what is, or, or what is fake news? Who should we put it in the hands of? And I, th I think this is fasc fascinating in a lot of ways. You think it's a problem. Half of you said when we framed it, uh, as the biggest problem, said this is the biggest problem available. So who's responsible for it? Most of you say individuals, um, that it's up to you to decide, right? It's up to you to decide what is fake news or not, um, which is a little bit interesting when we talked about some of the earlier slides about government intervention or regulation or social media companies and how they regulate. Uh, but over, almost six out of ten of you said that individuals are, are responsible compared to about a quarter that said government and less than uh, one in five that said private companies such as Facebook or Twitter should be the ones to decide what it is. That's, this is a debate that's happening and playing out in real time in your lives. Companies are deciding this. Facebook spent a lot of the last year uh, and Twitter looking at how they might think about regulating this. So this is a real life situation that's playing out and will play out over the next few years. I think we're gonna go to our last slide. Uh, which we asked you once again, students should defy school administration to protest Sorry policies <laughs> on, or on issues they feel are important. And you could see uh, in the results that, that well over uh, three quarters of you said either that you strongly agree or somewhat uh, agree with this statement. That's practicing First Amendment rights, right? That's practicing First Amendment rights is a long uh, glorious history of civil disobedience. Um, in your environment, this is, is clearly a, a place that, that has, has the issues of safety, concern, uh, your daily routines. I think these are all powerful, but most of you agreed with, the, agreed with that statement. The First Amendment does not protect students, and we can talk about whether it should, but it does not protect students in the same way it does other citizens in this sort of civil disobedience. Although, again, the hallmark of civil rights of suffragettes, of people who campaigned for immigration reform, labor rights, was that uh, matters of conscience at times meant that they would violate the law of the moment that they felt was not correct. But they did it as a matter of conscience. And if you watch the civil rights movement, the most successful example of the First Amendment in action, you almost always hear those early civil rights workers say, we understand that we were going to be arrested. We understand that the, that the rule of law was important. What we were going to do is by virtue of our confidence of our courage, we're going to make people understand that that law is wrong. So uh, again, we, we want to put a shading on, on the result here. I actually am proud of you for saying that you would consider it, but I think it should be done in a measured way that you understand both the benefits and the risks. Gene, we're going to move on to the, the next section, but I want to put up one last slide that I forgot uh, that's kind of a follow-up to this. If you could just move to the next slide. Uh, freedom of speech must be restricted uh, if it conflicts with national security. You can see that most of you agreed with that. There is one more related to schools, I think, that we, we have. Do we have one more? Uh, oh, yeah. Tolerance for others, uh, religion, race, and opinion should be required class in, in all schools. Really interesting perspective. Should we have to think about that? We have to learn about our rights, 
our expression, our freedoms, our ability to express the way we will, but do we think about how we express our, our perspectives? And I think this is a fascinating perspective. Most of you think or agree with that statement. So I know we're moving on to the next stage at this point. Thank you so much for, uh, for listening to our polling results and to share the time. Thank you very much. Quick question. By a show of hands, were you students surprised that people didn't know uh, what the First Amendment freedoms are? Show of hands if you're surprised. Let's move on. Students, I want to thank both of you first of all. Thank you, thank you. Student staff and invited guests, please receive Alice Steinbaugh. She's the chair of the Social Studies Department here, and she teaches economics. Alex, the stage is yours. I want to thank Dr. Bork and Mr. Polisinski for uh, presenting their analysis of the survey and all of you students and teachers for your participation and your input uh, that gave us such interesting results. Um, I know a lot of you had conversations in your classrooms following the survey about the First Amendment, uh, and I want to continue those conversations here by introducing the question and answer portion of today's event. Um, Your teachers gathered uh, the questions that you students posed during those discussions so that we could have students ask questions of our experts here. Uh, And we have some of your classmates down here in the front who are ready to do that, to ask your questions. Uh, Joining your fellow students to kick off the questions for our experts and me um, are David Erdman and Craig Staudenmeyer. Our first questioner, Mr. Erdman, has served as an advocate for free press issues throughout his career as a reporter, city editor, managing editor, and editor-in-chief of The Morning Call. He was recognized with the Pennsylvania News Media Association's Benjamin Franklin Award for Excellence for his work in support of media access to government records. He is a past president of the Pennsylvania Society of News Editors and is currently an adjunct instructor in media and communications at Muhlenberg College. Our second questioner, Mr. Staudenmeyer, is partner in the Harrisburg firm of Nauman, Smith, Schisler, and Hall and has an extensive federal and state trial practice in the area of right to know and media law. Mr. Staudenmeyer is also general counsel to the Pennsylvania Freedom of Information Coalition, and he too is a past recipient of the Benjamin Franklin Award for Excellence. So Mr. Erdman, I'll let you uh, start us off. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thanks to both of you for uh, that. I learned something every time I I see this, uh, to be honest. And so... uh, Thank you for giving me the first question. Today we hear the phrase, the media is the enemy of the people, right? And although the the Parkland students don't say exactly that, there are a few in there who are saying that, but many, many more Americans agree with that phrase. And of course, the media can be wrong, but you know, as messy as it is, why don't people get this, that it's the cornerstone, one of the cornerstones, and some believe maybe one of the key cornerstones of of our democracy. You know, Jefferson said, he, if asked whether it'd be best to have government without newspapers or newspapers without government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. So this question is for Mr. Polisinski, but I'd like Dr. Boric to address it too. You know, what is really going on? I know you talked about different aspects, but you know, what is the anger? What is, and is this different than in any period in history? Or, or is this kind of just looking back in history? Yeah, this is kind of how things go. I'm interested in, in, in a broader context on this. Today, the term fake news has become so politicized and used as a political weapon, it almost has no meaning. Uh, We've always had propaganda, uh, deliberate attempts to distort. We've always had wrong information because somebody screwed up. I think we're caught up in a time when all institutions are being questioned, government, you know, uh, used car dealers, uh, everybody. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, My question is for all three of you. Gene, on behalf of the general public, um, Alice, on behalf of high school age students, and Chris, on behalf of college age um, students, what what do you, what do you think could be done to increase the public's knowledge of the rights under the First Amendment? Well, first of all, programs like this, but also what obviously is going on here that is not happening in the vast majority of, of schools in America, which is a reemphasis in a in a time when we certainly have to have the STEM focus and emphasis on certain kinds of 
of higher levels of, of math and science uh, is a re-engagement with the ability of what does it mean to be an American citizen and what are your freedoms. You know, it's a lot harder to take away something that I fully understand than if I just have a vague notion of it and somebody comes along with what they say is a better idea. Alice is an educator. Um, one thing we can do, I think, is to keep telling the stories of those who perhaps don't have these First Amendment rights. Um, the press needs to tell these stories. Our history teachers, our language teachers need to tell these stories so that we can begin to imagine ourselves not having those rights, to put ourselves in the place of the people in those stories. Um, and then the second thing I think that, that we can do is to, um, at the high school, to allow students to find their voices and to practice expressing their ideas and listening to the um, ideas of their fellow students. The more that we can identify with those who don't have the rights and practice those rights in our, our everyday lives, the more awareness I think we'll have of them. I'll just briefly reiterate what, what you just said, Alice. I think at the college level, um, we don't do a great job of focusing on uh, First Amendment rights, government in general. We've got students for, I'm a political scientist, so I have students take my political science class and we'll talk about it uh, in detail. But not, most students are never going to take a class at the college level. So we kind of, once you finish here, uh, most of you that are going off to college, unless you're heading in the path of political science, might not think about these things again in an academic setting for some time. Uh, and so reinforcing what you might have learned here is something we don't do the best job of at the, at the college level. And I think now we're going to hear a question from one of the uh, Parkland students. Yeah, I'd like to call up uh, Jacob Roth with a student question. To what extent is hate speech protected under the First Amendment to the Constitution, and how does the setting make a difference? So let me do a ex quick example here. Um, I might uh, wish to be a speaker attacking a particular ethnic or religious group or social group in society, and I rail about them and talk about how awful they are, and, and um, you know, and it's pretty hateful. If I were to say, and there's one now, go get them, that I've crossed the line from protected speech into something else. Uh, but we have a right to be hateful, to be repugnant. And there's a Supreme Court justice who wrote an opinion in 1948 that said, sometimes we need to hear that kind of speech if only to be better prepared to argue against it. Free speech isn't free to the extent that you could say anything, anytime, any place. If you put people at risk in immediate harm, as Jean said, you're not protected, right? If you're, if you're you know, the, the old fire in the movie theater thing, right? right? You right. can't yell that and say, hey, it's free speech. That's my right to do it. People will be harmed because they don't have time to think. If you have time to think, even the most repugnant speech has to be protected. You have to allow that in the public discourse. So, so hate speech, is, as Gene said, I think, on its nature, unless it's immediate and, and, and can cause harm to, to an individual uh, physically often, um, we are going to protect it in a general way, as repulsive as it could be. Yeah. David? Okay. Thank you. Um, a quarter of Americans favor increasing the government's role in forcing social media sites to monitor and remove offensive content. A much smaller percentage of the students in this room here agree with that, and I certainly agree, too, that social media can be a cesspool, right? I, mean, I think we all can. But having government step in and moderate an area which is essentially a free exchange of ideas. So, Alice Steinbaum, you know... <laughs> We talked a little bit about this. We heard from, from uh, the pollsters here, you know, but what's really going on? Is there a, do you see students rebelling in general against social media, or what's really going on, you know, psych, sort of psychologically here? I think there's something more going on than we've heard from Dr. Gorup, Dr. Boric and Mr. Polisinski. Um, students who have grown up with these social media platforms are probably more aware than, than most of us of both the good and the harm that speech on those platforms can do. Facebook alone has 2.3 billion active users. Uh, and because it's international, it acts independently, largely, of any one government. Um, and I think students seeing that and, and having experienced the power of the speech on those giant platforms know that this is a potential weapon of mass destruction. Um, and as such, I think they might be feeling that perhaps 
there's a role for government to place a limit on the deployment of that weapon. Um, now I'd like to hear a question from Nina Hart. Uh, so why can public universities have safe spaces if the First Amendment protects free speech there? The, the idea of, of creating a safe space, right, where you might not have to be uh, affected by things that are hateful or damaging, uh, I could see the merit in it. But I, I, as a professor, being uncomfortable is often really part of the learning experience. Um, and, and not that you should live in, in a place that is uh, of tension and fear all the time, but sometimes not feeling totally secure, at least in an academic environment, not in a physical environment, it's a different yeah. thing, but in an academic environment is part of our experience, is part of our experience. So uh, trying to find that balance between making sure people aren't feeling under constant duress uh, and allowing them to be challenged and pushed in ways that is often uncomfortable uh, is what we try to, to create on college campuses. As I tell students when I come in my class, I hope you challenge each other all the time. I hope you push each other uh, to, to come up. And I hope once in a while folks say when you're, you're given a good argument, you changed your mind, right? And you can only do that sometimes with situations that are uncomfortable. It's a fabulous question and not easy to, to address. Could you explain for the students the difference, though, quickly between you know, what they might say here on the grounds of Parkland High School versus, say, out on the street corner down in Allentown or out here on Cedar Crest Boulevard, for that matter, if there's a sidewalk. You know, you have all of your First Amendment rights as a student, every one of them the same as a, an adult. But your ability to speak them is restrained starting back with a, a court decision in the late 60s. One, you can't disrupt the teaching process, the pedagogical process. That's why you're here. Schools have a mission. So you can't stand up in the middle of the math test and deliver a stirring political speech uh, as much as you might want to. And also, you can't override the rights of other students. You don't have a right to, to uh, you know, use your right of free speech, let's say, to simply dominate a discussion over another student or insult them. We all have an obligation as citizens to get, to get you ready to be fully citizens and participate in our democracy. And I think sometimes that's an extra burden that we have to assume in, in schools. But there are restraints on you, unlike uh, other groups of citizens. As opposed to what they might do out in a public square. Yeah, the minute yeah. you step out on the th onto the public sidewalk, uh, you have the same rights as any other person of any particular age or occupation or, or orientation. So keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the public sidewalk. All right, Alice, this question is for you. What would you advise these young people here that gathered today is the most important takeaway oh. to come away with from this program for their future and their rights under the First Amendment? Um, I, I want you all to feel empowered by these rights that you have um, so that you can use them to express yourselves, um, but also so that you can use and appreciate the opportunity that you have to hear the voices of others. Um, and that this motivates you to want to protect your right to express yourself and to hear those other views. That's what I would like to see as the takeaway from this. Uh, next, we're going to get a question from Sahil Anaganti. So what guidelines should school and university administrators follow to determine any limits of free speech in school when what is considered offensive is constantly changing? If it's personal attacks, Within a school, we talked about some of the, the findings yeah. there. Individuals are being targeted without a, a threat of physical, but it's clearly designed to, to harm. Um, it, within a school setting, it, it, I think it has a higher standard of protection. We talked about the differences in different places than it would in the general public, where you know it's part of part of free speech. So, so those lines are start getting harder to to, to develop as we move away from some of the direct harm. It, surely, free speech is your right. You get to say things. You get to say uh, many of your opinions. But there's responsibility to that, and in a community, there's responsibility. And so, it may mean that you could say it. That doesn't mean necessarily that you should say it. And so that comes back to a community educating its members on how to have discourse and how to have dialogue. 
and not just saying you can't say that, but to think about what you say and what the repercussions are. So it's, it's a challenge, as I said before. Some of the lines are clear when we're talking about protection of individuals' uh, physical and, and, and personal uh, well-being. Uh, but then we open the door a little bit more, and that's, I don't know, if the, from a school perspective, where that might fit, Alice. The, the key in, within school is to create an opportunity uh, and to sort of model, perhaps for all the adults in the world, um, how to um, have those conversations and to listen to each other in a way that's respectful. And I know um, our teachers are very good at, at, at uh, coming up with ways and, and helping students express themselves and, and practice that responsibility. All right, well, this, this question I'm going to throw open to whoever wants to field it. I'm going to quote Voltaire, or at least most people attribute this to Voltaire, the expression, and you hear this a lot when people talk about free speech, I may not agree with what you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. Does that quote have any relevance today on basis of what we've talked about with social media, the media being portrayed as the enemy of the state, uh, the various opinions about hate speech and things? Does that mm -hmm. quote have any meaning today at all? And if so, how? I think the great challenge for you is that you're going to live in an environment in which you are much more often confronted in a much more emotional and direct way with views that are counter to those you hold. And that may be because there are views from another country, another faith, another group of individuals across the country who have experienced life very differently than you have. You're really going to be tested in what the American experiment is all about. And that is this marketplace of ideas where all can be heard, Consider, and then we will come together and make decisions for the largest number of people. Um, next, I'd like to have a question from Sarah Begg. Why doesn't freedom of speech apply to private schools or private companies like the NFL? There was a recognition that Facebook or the NFL are, are private entities, sort of like citizens. In fact, in the law, they're corporations, they are citizens, um, and they have their own free speech rights. We prize the right of being able to speak so strongly that we, we chose not to restrain individuals or private entities saying that they have their free speech rights. So it's really outside the realm. Now, that's not necessarily to say the spirit of the First Amendment shouldn't apply, but the law doesn't. Trojans, I'd like you to give your classmates who are brave enough to ask ah, questions an great. applause. Ah. Now, we have a little more insight to share with you uh, I'd like you all to welcome Chuck Eppolito. He's the president of the Pennsylvania Bar Association, and he's here to explain the importance of your rights and responsibilities as it relates to the First Amendment. Chuck. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you bright students and guests at Parkland High School participating in this First Amendment program. With great power comes great responsibility. Now, you may have heard that quote from a Marvel Comics movie, but it is actually much older than that. Many historians believe that that statement originated with Voltaire, the French historian, philosopher, and writer in the 1700s. Voltaire influenced the writings and the thoughts of our founding fathers, including Presidents John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. As this program comes to a close and you head back down the halls and you return to your day-to-day -day activities, I hope this quote stays with you. With great power comes great responsibility. Now, I'm confident all of you are familiar with one of these devices. Most of you are likely on social media, whether it be Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, or some other platform. Whether you realize it or not, you likely exercised your First Amendment rights to free speech multiple times every day. Technology is feeding free speech. In the future, your ability to speak freely will likely grow exponentially greater because of cell phones and the next communication devices that haven't even been invented yet. That is power. Now that you understand the importance of the First Amendment and the power that it gives you, you have a responsibility to exercise those rights. And you have a responsibility to make sure that you defend your rights and the rights of others under the First Amendment. So, in the future, should the government attempt to limit free speech in a way with which you disagree, you have a right to make your opinion known. 
Should the free press and news media come under unwarranted attack and you disagree, you have a right to make your opinion known. Should your college rescind an invitation to a controversial speaker and you disagree, you have a right to make your opinion known. Should you disagree with the words of others who are exercising their rights of free speech, I ask that you respect them. They have a right to speak freely. In fact, you should defend their right to speak freely. Every American has a right to free speech. In fact, the right to free speech and those other rights that we've been talking about today were of the utmost importance to our founding fathers. They were so important and so primary that our founding fathers chose to preserve those rights in the very first amendment. This is my takeaway to all of you today. Whether it is through this device or through some other device that comes along at some point in the future, whether it's today through your thoughts or your words or your writing in the classroom or at some point down the road in your life. Exercise your First Amendment rights and exercise them wisely. Be responsible because with great power comes great responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Chuck, thank you. We hope this program about the First Amendment has enlightened you about your freedoms, and we hope you can name the five freedoms of the First Amendment. For all of us at PBS 39, I'm Monica Evans. Thank you so much for joining us.